In this video, we're going to begin our coverage of Carlsen's games in the Alicon. We're going to go through them variation by variation, so we'll be switching between when he was a young player growing up and also to the world champion that we all know and admire. So in this first game, we're going to take a look at Carlsen's approach to the 3 knight c3 line. If we just backtrack a little bit, the main move for white here is e5, and Carlsen has only once faced the main alternative, which is 2 knight c3. And this was back in, in Gazdale in 2003. And I always figured, and this game confirms it, that Carlsen would play e5 here, as he's often a 1e5 player, e4, e5, and here he's avoided the Scotch, the Italian, the Spanish, so I'm sure he's very happy here. However, this particular position, after the move knight f3, I covered this quite extensively in my Rapid, rapid and Blitz repertoire for white, and I also covered bishop c4, the Vienna game, briefly in uh, my attacking manual course as well. Uh, my attacking play manual. So I feel like there's no point repeating myself here and instead in the theory course I'm going to recommend d5 here with the idea of playing after e5 the move d4 which I think is the most reliable uh, move for black. Instead knight fd7 is also possible but once again after d4 e6 uh, if we play knight f3 here if white plays knight f3 then we transpose back into a line that I recommended for white in the rapid and blitz repertoire and also we have to worry about f4 and knight ce2. And this is, of course, a French defense and not an Alakine. So I think we shouldn't go for that. Instead, d4 is the best move um, for our purposes. And knight e4 is also possible, but knight ce2 is a bit dangerous for black. So I think d4 is what we'll go for there. Um, instead, e5 is what we're going to look at now. And after knight d5, bear in mind that Carlsen has also played knight g8 here. And I also covered this in my Rapid and Blitz repertoire for black in the bonus chapter. And he played it against Fresnay and won a nice game. So you can check that out there as well. Uh, knight d5 is the main move by far, though. And here, the main move is d4. And also c4 is possible as well, and there are some independent tries there too. Instead, we're going to start with a game that you probably haven't seen. This is the Blitz game that Carlsen played with Black uh, on chess24.com last year, uh, using his Magsy Bogues account. Um, White played 3 knight c3, which is also a popular line. The interesting thing about this game is that Carlsen actually outrated his opponent by a lot. Um, he was more than double. He had more than double the rating points of his opponent. He was rated 3380 on the Chess 24 server, which is ridiculous, and his opponent was rated 1638. Now, even allowing for that, um, this was a blitz game, and White's opponent, White actually played very well in this game. Um, all things considered, he, he gave a very good account of himself. But uh, I think it is important to look at games like this, where the difference in strength between the players is, is huge, because uh, it, it gives people a chance to see the strategies for both sides demonstrated very clearly. So oftentimes one player will not play the best moves and the refutation can be quite simple and instructive. So in this case, e6 and c6 are both decent moves for black, but Carlsen's choice is knight takes c3. And this is the main line and we'll cover this. I see no reason not to recommend this for black. d takes is white's main try. Uh, b takes is also possible, but it's a different approach where white tries to strengthen his center. Here, after d takes, he goes for a lead in development. He wants to use the, the fact that the pawn on e5 cramps black a bit and free up his queen on d1 and also potentially bring his bishop out to f4. So he's just trying to speed up his development at the cost of doubling his pawns. Of course, black should strike back in the center with d6. And here, white won't be able to maintain the pawn on e5, but he can support it with his pieces and hope that if black ever takes on e5, that queen takes d8 and trading queens will uh, force black's king to recapture and leave his king stuck in the center. So white is really hoping to land a blow before black gets developed here. He plays bishop f4, which is one of the main moves here. Knight f3 is another good move. And Carlsen just played knight c6, increasing the pressure on e5. And here white played knight f3, just developing and defending e5. And this is the first interesting moment of the game. Carlsen played bishop g4, which is actually the most played move here. But it's a move that the engines don't really like, and in fact it looks like white has an edge after this. So from, from a, a theoretical point of view, I had a look at this with a computer, and I found a very interesting novelty for black. And I, I, I bet that if I gave you this position as an exercise, it might take you quite a while to come up with the computer's idea here. It's very unusual. The move is queen d7. <laughs> and I'm not joking, this is actually quite a decent move for black, and it may well be the best move in the position. It reminded me of the game 
uh, Vityukov from against Caruana in a Petrov in Baden-Baden in 2018, where Caruana played Queen D7, actually on move five. This is move six, so he got away with Queen D7 even earlier in that game. Uh, but the idea was completely different, and I've referenced that game in the notes. You can check it out. Um, the point behind Queen D7 here is that if Black tries to play F6, which is quite desirable from a positional point of view, he wants to trade off the E5 pawn for his G7 pawn and get a huge clump of pawns in the center. If he plays it immediately, then after E takes F6, G takes F6, Black's king is very exposed on E8, and after Knight D4, he will have to forego castling rights because Queen H5 check is coming next, and there's no easy way to stop it. If Black ever plays H5, it's too weakening. White can play Bishop D3 with the idea of jumping at the G6 with check. So that's not very good for, for Black. Um, now, actually, this position may only be even slightly better for White, if anything, because uh, Black's king will be quite safe in the center behind his big wall of pawns. But if you can imagine that Black's queen was on d7, he could comfortably meet this with e5, and then meet queen h5 check with queen to f7 blocking the check. And that's one of the main points behind queen d7. So going back, if Black starts with queen d7, of course queen g4 is another possibility in some positions. But if White plays bishop d3, we follow up with f6, and after, d take, after e takes, g takes, and knight d4, Black can absolutely play e5 if he likes, and this should be fine for black. But also queen g4 is very decent. And once again, if the queens are exchanged here, uh, black's king is going to be very safe on e8, and he has a massive wall of central pawns. Um, he's got two clear extra central pawns, um, and the, the, the g7 pawn is clearly better on f6 than on g7. So black is doing fine here. And indeed, that's the positional drawback of white's line here. Uh, black has two extra central, he's two central pawns against one. So this is quite pleasant for Black if he finishes development and uh, gets his piece set successfully. The problem with Bishop G4 is that White can play the, the really strong move H3 here. And here if Black takes on F3, um, he can take on E5 with the Knight because White will take on B7. He might take on E5 first and, and then take on B7, but generally Black's light squares on the Queen side are going to be destroyed with no light square Bishop, and his King will be very vulnerable on E8. Um, so black should take with the d-pawn, but here white again is a star move, and I invite you to pause the, pause the video and have a think about what the, the correct response for white is, is here. Among other things, white can play bishop a6, and this undermines the knight on c6, and is very scary to meet over the board, and objectively should be quite good for white. Instead, after h3, bishop h5 is better, retaining the bishop, but after g4, and now after queen e2, White has an initiative here. Black can try and shore up the position. White might play e6 somewhere, so it makes sense to go e6 and d5 ourselves, but then white can try and crack open the position with c4 as well. In general, this looks slightly unpleasant for black. Uh, white has white has a few tempi ahead in development, and it's not going to be easy to equalize here. And indeed, in the only test this game has, white did eventually win. Or this line has, sorry. Um, so it's not quite a novelty, but it, it is. it has only been played very rarely. Um, but I do think it's quite good for white. So queen d7 may actually be a very important theoretical improvement here, even though everybody plays bishop g4. So after bishop g4, Carlos' opponent faltered. He played e takes d6, and this is not the most challenging move. Here, black already has a choice of recaptures, and Carlson, true to his style, went for the simplest with c takes d6, which is perfectly good for black. And now, once again, you can see that, white is, that black has two central pawns against none. And this gives him very, very good control over the center and definitely makes up for white slight lead in development. E5, however, is also fine, targeting the bishop on f4. And if it also gains time for development, and if white tries to go bishop g5, targeting the queen on d8, then bishop takes f3 will leave black a piece up at the end of all the exchanges. You, you can check that out yourself. Bishop takes f3 uh, and bishop takes d1 is going to win a piece. Um, so instead, C takes d6 was Carlson's choice, which is also fine. And after bishop e2, he decided to stay flexible and just play the move e6. Uh, the move e5 is also good. This gains time for development. And probably white won't get a chance to play c4 and put a clamp on d5. Um, but in, even if he does, black can even play f5 later on. So black's central pawns stand him in very good stead here. Instead, e6 is also fine. But it would give white the chance to play knight d4 here. And often you'll see that in games between players where one side seems to lose without a fight, it's because they missed the chance to uh, simplify or find the correct moment to change the course of the game or change the nature of the position. And here, uh, knight d4 is probably the best way to do this. Castles is a bit too routine, 
It's not, not wrong, but it's not going to pose any problems for black. Bishop e7 was Carlson's choice, and then castles. So white has completed his development, and he doubles in the d-file to try and put pressure on d6. And here, Carlson played queen b6, putting pressure on the b2 pawn, and getting out of the way of the d-file. Instead, e5 is also a good move again. And after bishop e3, queen c7, black has completed his development, and his extra central pawns actually give him a slight advantage. Um, he has more space in the center than white, and his pieces are very comfortably placed. Instead, queen b6 was Carlson's choice, and after b3, the c3 pawn is temporarily quite weak, and Carlson decided to fix this by playing d5. And now he has a simple plan of doubling on the c-file, if possible with his rooks, and just putting pressure directly on the c3 pawn. So white tries to cut across this plan by playing knight e5. And this is very sensible. The more pieces that come off the board, the better it is for white, because black has two central pawns that give him extra space in the center. And if white trades off pieces, then this extra space won't matter so much. Um, it's slightly counterintuitive because you think that with pawn weaknesses, white shouldn't be trading pieces. But in fact, if he does, say in this sort of position, he can sometimes play c4 here and liquidate the central pawns. Or sorry, liquidate the double pawns, and this should be fine for white. Bear in mind here that white is threatening knight d7, so black needs to stop that. He played rook a d8. But now white has sort of freed his position somewhat, and he could have played the move rook d3. And this would have given him dynamic compensation for his double pawns on the c-file. He's going to try and swing the rook across the h3, maybe to g3, and gain some counterplay against black's king. Instead, he played the move a4, which gained space on the queen side. It's not a bad move. Slightly strange, but um, it's, not, it's not terrible. And black played bishop f6, putting more pressure on the knight on e5. And now finally, white should definitely have played rook d3 here. Instead, he made a, a slight misstep with bishop e3. And this basically undermines his own knight on e5. Uh, it's going to be impossible to maintain that knight where it is now. And after queen c7, uh, the knight is forced to move or exchange itself. White took on c6, but here black could have taken in either way. Carlson decided to take with the queen, which is very natural, putting more pressure on c3. But equally valid is b takes c6, and with such a massive, cent pawn, um, a massive clump of pawns in the center, uh, black is doing really well. He's gaining time on the pawn on c3, and he can easily advance the central pawns later. However, after queen takes, Carlson is a master at giving people choice and giving them a chance to mess up. And here, white played a very natural move, which I'm sure he didn't think too much about. It's a blitz game after all, um, so we shouldn't be too hard on white, of course. But the move that he played uh, basically ruins his last chance of equalizing. And here is another situation where if white thought for a moment and realized how dangerous this position is for him, if he follows the natural route, then uh, he may actually find the correct choice, which is not easy to play. So have a think about this and decide what do you think is the best move for white here. Well, in the game, white played bishop d4, which is very natural, and I guarantee a lot of players this would be their first instinct. However, after bishop takes d4, c takes d4, and rook c8, the weakness on c2 is very much exposed. If white's pawns were back on b2 and a2, then he could play c3 and solidify his chain just a little bit. Um, black was still of easy play there. He could try and advance his own b-pawn to try and weaken the c3 pawn, but he'd have no direct attack just yet. Instead, here, with the pawns the way they are, the c2 pawn is clearly backward and a very, very vulnerable to attack. So instead of this, the correct choice for white is to play c4. And this is a very ugly move, but dynamically it works very well for white. Bear in mind that black's own a7 pawn is also hanging. Um, right now, taking on a7 would allow his bishop to get trapped with b6, but in, if the queens come off, then this could actually be a legitimate threat. So after c4, d takes c4, rook takes d8, rook takes, and queen takes c4, as ugly as white's pawn structure is, he has dynamic counterplay. As I mentioned, a7 is hanging. If black plays a6, then the b7 pawn will be hard to protect after rook b1. So instead he goes for b6, but once again after rook b1, White can easily break on the queen side with c5 or a5 and liquidate his weak pawns. And he has enough counterplay to hold the draw here. So this would have gone a long way to nullifying black's massive rating advantage in this game. However, bishop d4 is a very routine move and a very natural move. But after takes takes and rook c8, black is slightly better already. And uh, Carlson just plays very well after this as well. After rook d2, 
Rook c7, very simply, he just doubles. White played queen d3, and this is also a step in the wrong direction. Instead, rook c1 was essential, and the point here is that white overprotects the pawn on d3 on c2, which gives him a chance to free some of his other pieces. After rook fc8, white is able to play rook d3, and potentially activate this rook in uh, some sort of kingside attack, which might give him some counterplay. This wouldn't work if black's queen weren't in front of his two rooks. Having the major pieces tripled on an open file is actually known as Alakine's cannon, uh, which is appropriate considering we're talking about the Alakine defense. But in this situation, the queen is in front of the two rooks. It's much better to have the queen behind, as it is the most valuable piece. So if you traded places, if the queen and, and the rook on c8 traded places, if the rook was on c6 and the queen was on c8, then white would be unable to move his rook away from d2 in view of rook takes c2, and white would just lose a c2 pawn. However, with the queen in front, he is able to play rook d3, and this does give him some counterplay. So if you ever if you ever are tripling your major pieces on an open file, try to keep your queen at the back. Instead, queen d3 was played in the game, but after rook fc8, white played rook c1. And here, this is also probably not best. Uh, the c2 pawn is defended sufficiently, but black is a very nice way to try and get through here. So have a think about what Magnus might have played here. Well, the most logical move is queen c3, and this indeed was Magnus's choice. He trades off white's only active piece, which is the queen on d3. This was the only piece that white had that was doing anything. It was keeping an eye on h7, um, and potentially eyeing up some counterplay. Maybe he could play queen b5 later on, or something like that. Um, whereas here, if black trades off the queen, then there, white has no active pieces left, and after queen takes, rook takes, uh, all you have to do is compare the, the, two, the both sides' rooks to see... Uh, who is better here? Clearly, black is much better. White's rooks couldn't really be more passive, and in fact, rook takes b3 is already a threat in view of the pin along the c-file. Instead, if white had tried to retain the queens of queen e2, it's already too late for that. After queen b2, c2 is exposed, c1 is hanging, and if white plays queen d1, then black already has a nice tactic that wins on the spot. Watch he play. Queen takes b3, and if c takes, rook takes c1, wins a clear pawn for black, and leaves white with weaknesses on d4 and b3, which I'm sure Magnus would have no trouble converting, and I wouldn't say you, you would either. Instead, queen e1 was uh, is, is possibly a better try, with the point being that if we go for the same combination, then after rook takes c1, white has the option of playing rook d1, blocking the, 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 uh, the back rank, so that white is just an extra a queen for rook up. But it does leave c2 undefended. And black can just take on c2 simply, and after takes, takes. White may have better drawing chances here than in the game, but black's queen is very active, and white's pawns are still weak, so uh, chances are that black would win here as well. Instead, after queen takes, rook takes, the rook ending should be an easy win for black, and in fact it's impossible for white to avoid losing a pawn already. After king f1, rook takes b3. King e2 was white's choice, he decided not to take in view of rook takes check and then perhaps black would play rook c3 uh, or rook b1 and white's pawns are going to be very weak probably rook c3 is better keeping control over the c-file but after king e2 rook a3 this was no better the a4 pawn is hanging as well and after rook b1 b6 and rook b4 white's rook is very awkward on b4 and it's simply just tied to defending the a pawn black just activated his king with king f8 and after f4, he stopped any potential counterplay from white with f5 by playing g6. White played g3, and Magnus was in no hurry. He played h5. So this pawn structure is very strong. It's almost impossible to get at the base on f7, and all of white's breaks in the kingside are contained. He played king d1, rook a1 check, and rook c3. So the other rook is coming in, and either one of these pawns is going to fall. And after king f2, rook a2, uh, white in fact resigned, as c2 is dropping. So, a very interesting game. Um, I know it was quite one-sided, but only after a certain point. White did defend himself quite well for a long time, and I just thought it was instructive that, uh, Mag and, and indicative of Magnus' style these days. He just plays very simply, he gives his opponent a lot of choice, and he's not afraid to simplify the position if the structure is in his favour. So, that's basically the sum total of Magnus' experience against the sidelines. Uh, people don't tend to go for this, these, these lines against him. And especially if he's playing on the top level a lot, 
the, the choice more often than not is going to be d4. Uh, we'll take a look at c4 as well, just briefly. I'm just going to mention this. Um, in my uh, Rapid and Blitz repertoire for black in the bonus chapter, I gave the move knight b4, which is definitely only for blitz and specifically for online blitz. It works quite well there, but I wouldn't recommend it otherwise. Uh, but of course the main move is knight b6, and here, more often than not, white will transpose to the main lines after d4, that we'll look at in a moment. But he can also play the chase variation with c5, or the move a4 as well. So we'll check these out in the theory section. Instead, d4 was Aronian's choice, and this is the, the game we're going to look at now. Knight b6 uh, is a sideline that Carlsen played once against Naroditsky last year, but he did lose the game. I think he was doing okay in it, but it is a sideline, and we're not going to cover it here. I think d6 is a more reliable choice, and is Carlsen's overwhelmingly favorite choice too. And here, the main moves for white are knight f3, which is the absolute main line, and c4 which introduces two other possible main lines, the exchange variation and the four pawns attack. There are other moves for white, which we'll cover too, but those are the two main ones. Here we're going to take a look at c4. After knight b6, e takes d6 is the exchange variation, and this was Aronian's choice. And Carlsen used to play e takes d6, and we're going to check this out in the next clip and see how he used to handle those positions and why he may have moved away from them when he came back to playing the Alakine recently. c takes d6, uh, is his choice these days, and I think that it's the most dynamic option for black and gives him the most winning chances. And so it will be my recommendation in this course as well. And in fact, I found an amazing idea in the main line that I think is very exciting and that will give you lots of success. So Aronian played knight c3, g6. I should mention this game took place on leechess.org last year. Bishop e3 and bishop g7. This is black's idea. He wants to develop the bishop in sort of Grunfeld style and put direct pressure on d4 which has been weakened because white has no e-pawn, and he's also played c4, so that can't support the d4 pawn either. And here Aronian played h3, which is actually very logical. The point behind it is that oftentimes, if white ever plays knight f3, black will play bishop g4 directly to pin the knight. So white tries various ways of delaying the development of the knight on g1. One of these is the so-called Voronezh variation, which begins with rook c1, castles, and b3, which also makes a lot of sense trying to limit the knight on b6. And this has been the main headache for black in this variation for the past 20 or 25 years or so. And generally, consensus has, has reached that the consensus has been reached that e5 is the best move for black and probably equalizes. But it leads to a sort of boring endgame. Bishop f5 has been uh, the most popular recently because it has a, has a very good score for black. But of course, black is losing a tempo here if after knight f3 he wants to play bishop g4. However, this also isn't bad for black. But the most positionally desirable move, from my point of view, is d5. And I think that this makes a lot of sense. We're trying to uh, expose the d4 pawn to frontal attack. The problem is that c5 is possible. And here I discovered a line that has only been played three times uh, in both correspondence and over the board. And it's a fantastic piece sacrifice that I think give black, gives black a lot of play. After knight c6, c takes b6, and e5. Uh, your opponents are going to be very scared by this. And any theory that is involved here is theory that you'll know and that they probably won't. Uh, there's very little theory and a lot of it is analysis. And uh, I'm really excited to present this with to you. I think it's, it's a really exciting line. So we'll look at that in the theory section. I'm not sure what Magnus's choice would be here. Probably he'd go for bishop f5 or something a little more calm. But I, I really do believe in this and I think it's a great line for black. However, in this, in this game, Aronian's choice was h3. And after castles... He played knight f3, which was his big idea. Uh, now he develops comfortably without allowing bishop g4. So, Carson played knight c6. But here Aronian went wrong. He played d5. And this move is somewhat anti-positional. It frees up the bishop on g7. And also, after knight a5, it's going to be very difficult for white to defend his c4 pawn. But of course, Aronian is a fantastic player, and he had an idea behind this. And his point was that he was going to play bishop d4, trading off black's darts for bishop on g7, and also that if we take on c4, we're going to run into issues after bishop takes g7 and queen d4 check. This should be at least fine for white. However, Carlsen reacted in a very nice way. He played bishop takes d4, queen takes, and then e5. Uh, this is an excellent idea. In fact, e5 may even be slightly more accurate immediately. And after d takes, bishop takes... Black is developing quickly and attacking c4, and after takes king takes and queen d4 check, 
Here, black could simply play king g8 and transpose to the game, but also f6 might be slightly better even. And the point is that now the rook covers the f6 square, and we'll see in the game that Aronian was able to play knight e4 and try and drum up some play on the kingside dark squares. It didn't work that well, but we can take away the option completely if we play f6. So this might be even better. However, bishop takes and e5 is also fantastic for black. After d takes, bishop takes. White has to cut his losses. He needs to sacrifice the c4 pawn because he's so far behind development. He should play bishop e2, knight b takes c4, and castles. And here, white has enough compensation for the pawn, but not more. However, Aronian's idea was to play knight e4 and try to exploit the dark squares immediately. And indeed, it looks very scary at first. So have a think about how you might play this position with black. Would you panic, or what would you do? Well, Carlson reacted very coolly. He played knight c6, attacking the queen on d4, and after knight f6 check, he simply played king h8. And there's no double check. If the king was on g7, then yes, there'd be a knight h5 double check, which would be pretty scary. Um, but on h8, there's no double check, and that means there's no discovered check that works either, because the queen on d4 is hanging. So Aronian played queen f4. I guess the point is that if queen c3, then knight a4 at least would be quite good for black, as the queen just doesn't have enough squares in this diagonal to keep a defense of the knight on f6. So he played queen f4, and here uh, black has a couple of choices. In the game, Carlson went for bishop f5, which makes sense. But I'd like you to think about it and see if you can spot something that's even better. Well, black can actually take the c4 pawn. And the tactics work out for him. The point here is that white isn't really threatening queen h6 because the f6 knight is hanging completely. And his attack, while it looks kind of scary, it, it doesn't really work just yet. There's no way to increase the pressure on h7. And since h7 is the only meaningful square near the king that the knight on f6 attacks, then there's really no way for white to, to break through here. So black has time to snatch the pawn on c4. And for example, after bishop takes, bishop takes, queen takes, queen takes f6, he's just going to be a clear pawn up in this position. White finally catches up in development, but after rook ad8, black just has an extra d pawn, and it's passed as well. So white should try bishop e2 instead, but this gives black a chance to play knight 4 back to e5, and now he's got very good control over the, over the dark squares in the center, and after castles, king g7, he kicks out the knight on f6, and the d pawn is ready to run. So black has just an extra pawn here, and doesn't really have to worry about any attack on the king side. So this would have been the strongest way to play. Instead, Magnus played bishop f5, which also makes sense trying to kick the knight out of f6, but Aronian's knight g4 is a very strong move. It's almost the only move, but it also threatens knight e3 to target the bishop on f5, and it's in general it's quite good. So instead of playing rook e8 check, which was Magnus's choice, he should have gone for d5 and tried to use his extra pawn straight away, and his lead in development, and try to break over the position. And in that case, black would still have an edge. But after rook e8 check, if Aronian had found the move knight e3, then he'd be threatening to break the pin on the knight on e3 by going bishop e2, and then he could follow up with knight g5, and then he suddenly has real kingside threats. The bishop on f5 isn't so stable, it'll probably have to move, and f7 is weak, and suddenly black has things to worry about. The computer wants to play knight a4 here, um, which is very scary, but after bishop e2, knight takes b2, and castles, it seems like black is just about hanging on after rook e4 and queen f6. This does look a bit ropey, and in fact, white should have enough compensation after rook fv1, but it doesn't look like he has an advantage here. However, this is quite scary to play with black. So already, white could have tried to seize the initiative with knight e3. Instead, he played bishop e2, and now Carlsen came up with an excellent way to try and liquidate the position. What do you think he played? Well, this bishop e2 move leaves black with the option of trading pieces by playing bishop d3. And now, white's king will not escape the center. He needs to play knight e3 to block the e-file, but after bishop takes, king takes, Carlsen plays with great energy and goes for d5. And his threat is not only to take on c4, but also to play d4 and pick up a piece on e3 due to the pin. And I think Aronian must have seen this, but he went for the move knight g5, and I'm guessing what he missed was Carlsen's next, next move. King f1 is probably best, even though it blocks in the rook on h1. Black can play d4, knight g4, and f5 to attack white's knight, and after knight e5, takes, takes, and king g7, protecting against the, the fork on f7, of course. Um, black is a pawn up. Actually, no, sorry, black isn't a pawn up, but he is slightly better. Uh, the knight on e5 isn't so stable. 
The pawn on d4 is passed and it's more likely to be strong than weak, I think, um, because it's it's not easy for white to coordinate his rooks and to get his king off the back rank. But in general, this would be the lesser of the evils for white. Um, instead, he tried to keep the game complicated and went for knight g5. But after Carlsen's impressive rejoinder, which I think Aronian must have missed um, or, misunder or underestimated, uh, there was no way for white to avoid losing a piece with d4. White ca uh, Black calmly played queen e7. And the point is that after knight takes f7 check, king g7, it's only one check and it's only one pawn. And the knight on f7 is hanging, and if it moves back, then d4 will pick up the piece on e3 instead. So white can't avoid losing a piece. So Aronian had to bail out with rook hg1 here, but he, it just didn't work for him. King f1 was, was forced, but it's already quite bad for white. After f6 attacking the knight, the knight retreats. Black can simply take on c4. And after knight takes c4, queen e2 check, he can pick up the knight back on c4 with his queen on the next move and be a piece up. So that's just a clear extra pawn for black, and it's a pretty big one as well. And again, white still has difficulties getting his king off the back rank. Instead, Aronia went for rook hg1, but after d4, black wins a piece, and with careful play, he wins the game. Uh, we'll just quickly see how Magnus' technique finished things off. Takes rook takes, queen d7, knight takes check, king g7. White ends up with two pawns for the piece, but it's not enough, and we'll see why in a moment. Queen d4 was Magnus's choice, he just tried to simplify. There are alternative ways to win as well, but this is quite simple. Knight d6, we can't trade queen straight away because knight takes e8 check is a very strong uh, Zvishen shock, uh, which wins material back for white, so we need to be patient, move our rook, and obviously avoid any queen f7 check ideas too. So rook e7, queen takes d4, and knight takes, rook d3, and knight c6. And in view of the knight on d6 being stuck to the pawn on uh, being stuck defending the pawn on c4, white plays b3, and after knight d7, um, black has an extra knight compared to white's two pawns, but wh white's two pawns are split on either side of the board, and neither of them are passed or particularly far advanced. So the extra piece should just win the game. Uh, rook d1, knight c5, and a5. So Carlson went for this plan with a5, a4. Which is very interesting, he's chipping away at the pawn on b3. Normally they say that when you're material up, you should trade pieces, and when you're material down, you should trade pawns. But here, black is material up, and he's trading pawns, but the idea is that he's trying to uh, chip away at white's queenside pawns and create weaknesses, and open files for his rook. Note that his rook on a8 hasn't moved yet, um, but it can be developed from where it is by playing a5, a4. So part of becoming a very strong player is knowing when there are exceptions to the rules, and here I think it's an exception for black. Um, he should be trading pawns to try and activate his rook on a8. Rook b2 is played, knight b4, and after b takes a4, rook takes a4, a3, black played knight d3, obviously taking on a3 allows white to regain the piece on b4, but after knight bd3, this being an internet game, of course, uh, the game finished abruptly after rook b3, Aroni just hung the rook, but um, even here, he's going to find it very hard to survive, the a3 pawn, the c4 pawn, they're both weak, and the knight on d6 is no longer stable, so after rook d7, it will most likely have to move, and the c4 pawn will drop too. So black is winning here already. So again, a very interesting tussle from two of the strongest players of our time. And I think this is a very interesting introduction to the uh, exchange variation with c takes d6. In the next clip, we're going to look at e takes d6, and we're going to revisit Jung Carlsen's approach to this line. And I have thought some of the games here were interesting too, so we'll check these out and try to think about why he may have moved away from this line and chose c takes d6 instead these days. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next clip.